Hello and welcome to the Wormhole Podcast, episode 58. I'm Charlie Place, and joining me today is a businesswoman, an entrepreneur whose event production company recently spent three years on the Inc. 5000 list of fastest growing private companies in America. Now, you're asking why she's on the show. Well, she's also a classical musician and a jazz singer, and an excellent one, we're going to talk about it later, and recently published her memoir, which I believe many of you will be interested in reading. The book is called Relentless. Hello, Natasha Miller. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. It's absolutely excellent to have you on. Yeah, I've read your book and it's great and it's inspirational. What I would like to start on is the way this book has been produced. The cover says with Jamie Blaine and you've thanked him in the acknowledgements and he wrote the introduction. Can you tell us how you've created this book together? I can. He is just a dream. He was such an incredible partner to work with. So I had written 80,000 words on my own and I had a little bit of coaching, but not enough. And I was looking for what I thought needed to be a ghostwriter, but I had the term incorrect because I had already written 80,000 words. I didn't need a ghostwriter. I needed an editor. And so I did this massive search and I came up with one that wasn't so great. And let me tell you, it was an experience. It was a learning experience, but I also spent a lot of money on the wrong situation. Hmm. And so I hit pause for quite a bit of time. And then I started the search again and I just came to a woman, her name is Whitney, and she's the president of content capital. And she suggested after listening to what my story was about that I consider Jamie Blaine. Now at the time, I didn't know Jamie Blaine was a man and I'm not sure I would have immediately said, yes, I want a guy to help edit my book. But as it turns out, Jamie is a brilliant writer. He also is a musician and he writes for music magazines and and publications. And he is a psychologist. He has a degree in psychology and worked in trauma and situations that were really challenging. So he gets me. And so he really became my editor. And as we processed through the entire experience, He really became a co-writer and I could have paid work for hire and not put his name on the cover, but we built such an incredible relationship and he really did help me make the book, the beautiful work that it is that I just felt like I needed to honor him with that. Yeah, it's lovely. And yeah, I mean, it sounds like you found a kindred spirit. So I suppose you you could possibly work with him in the future in your writing, stuff like that. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, he's not going to help edit a business book for me. Like if I'm like, how to scale and grow your company by 50% or more, Mm -hmm. but (laughs) anything that is biographical or memoir-like or even fiction, he's just such a beautiful writer. Well, we've got your book, as I said, it's called Relentless and it is your memoir from your childhood all the way to the present day, really. And there's lots to talk about. Should we start with your reading? You've got a reading for us ready. I'm sure. So the reading is going to start somewhere in chapter three, Runaway is the name of the chapter. And there's a subtitle in each chapter. And that relates to a song that I've written over the last 20 some years. And just wanted to preempt by saying that if you read the book, that's amazing. But if you listen to the audible, which will be coming soon, the music is woven into all the readings and it's so cool. So I'll begin. My mom doubled down on me during freshman year, always yelling and screaming how stupid I was, grounding me, making me clean the kitchen and bathroom, then telling me what a terrible job I'd done. Around this time, my father decided to quit drinking. Sobriety is great, but now he was gone to AA meetings every night, and I was that much more alone. Secretly, I wished he were back in his chair downing six packs of Bud. At least he'd be home. But things were changing. I was coming of age and becoming a little more confident about my abilities. I'd started hanging out with the smart upperclassmen and looked to them for acceptance more than my family. They showed me that there was life outside of 29th Street, and the more I got a taste of it, the less I could tolerate living at home. So I ran away. 
I hid out at my friend Antoinette's house. She was a senior class president, valedictorian that year. It wasn't like I was running with a troublemaker. I waited an entire day before letting my family know where I'd gone. That'll teach my mother, I thought. My dad ended up letting me stay at Antoinette's for a whole week. And when he picked me up to take me home, Uncle Kevin was driving. By that point, I was ready to be someplace familiar. At Antoinette's house, I couldn't help but feel like I was underfoot. Even if home sucks, it's still home. Maybe things would be different now that I'd taken a step to show my parents how I felt. We drove straight down Kingman Boulevard, passing 29th. Hey, I said, looking back at our street, where are we going? My dad turned and leaned over the back seat. We're going to Broadlawn's hospital, he said, placing his hand on my knee, to the psychiatric ward. Emotions swirled, fear, confusion, shame. Broadlawn's was where poor people went. It's the place I was born. Why would they take me there? When we arrived, my mother was sitting on the bench of the waiting room, glowing with hate, refusing to speak or make eye contact with me. A staff member came and led me to an office where a psychiatrist in a maroon sweater vest and bright yellow tie motioned for me to take a seat. He made small talk before asking the following questions. Do you know what year it is? Do you know who the president of the United States is? Do you know why you're here? I had no idea these were the standard, are you crazy questions? I thought maybe the doc was off. The first two were easy, 1985, Ronald Reagan. The third was harder. Yes, I ran away from home, but admission to the psych ward seems like pretty harsh punishment. For that, I told the psychiatrist about my living situation and my mom's abusive behavior, giving him a picture of my grim existence. After a while, he brought me back out to the waiting room. My parents had taken me to Broadlands in hopes that the psychiatrist would commit me for at least two weeks. Instead, he told them, your daughter is in good mental health. We cannot admit her. Then he gestured to my mom. However, I think you should go into therapy. The look on my father's face said it all. My mother's fallout was nuclear and it rained on him too. So... He sent me to stay with Uncle Kevin. Thank you. Thank you. That is a good introduction. Can you tell us about your childhood? I grew up in the Midwest, in Des Moines, Iowa, in the mid-80s. And there was not much help for domestic violence or abuse or mental health. And my mother, I think, suffered a pretty horrible upbringing and had some issues that were not addressed. And she was just pretty horrible to me my entire life from the time I can remember. And I had two brothers and she adored them. She doted on them. But as far as being a good mother to them, that wasn't quite it. She just preferred them. So I lived a life of chaos and terror uh, I was threatened by her that she would kill me or try to kill me and go to jail. She didn't care. She just didn't want to see me again. You know, growing up that way um, really affects a person, as you can imagine. Mm. But thankfully, I had the violin since fourth grade to turn to. And music really was the catalyst that kept me alive, saved my life, and catapulted and propelled me into my future. Can you... Tell us how you went from where you were in the shelter and how you got to be emancipated. Yes. Yeah, so in the shelter that I was taken to when I was 16 on Christmas day, because my mother had definitely decided that she was definitely going to kill me that day. And I actually believed her this time. I showed up with a hefty garbage sack full of my things that I could grab in, you know, five minutes time. And there was talk of me going to foster care. And it's that time that I realized I might be removed from the area of Des Moines where I lived, where I was studying classical violin with a college professor at Drake University. And I just started advocating for myself. And I found a book in the office that was a legal book that basically explained to me that I was not a runaway. I was deemed an abandoned youth in the state of Iowa. 
Therefore, I could be unofficially emancipated because we didn't have that law officially. So at 16, I was free to leave that shelter. I was not welcome back home. I was able to live with my grandmother for a short time. And then I've been on my own since ever since. You kept in contact with your father. You've kept in contact with your brothers. They're very musical like you as well. Did you have contact with your mother as you got older? On and off, I did. She would disappear after fits of rage, sometimes for years. And when I say disappear, I mean from me. Uh, My brothers always knew where she was. And, you know, she kind of wove in and out of my life. I wanted her in my life. I wanted her to love me. I wanted her to be caring and warm and sweet. And sometimes she came close. Uh, She was actually very, very good with my daughter, Bennett, as a young girl and honestly through high school. And it's not that she's ever been not good to Bennett, but Bennett has taken the stance that she would prefer not to have a relationship with her. So, you know, I don't have contact with my mom now. It's not good for me. It's not good for my mental health. And I decided in late July of 2019 that I needed to take that pause and and maybe not pause, maybe make that definitive choice to not have her in my life. If I may ask, how or how, how do you feel that your experiences in your childhood influenced the person you have become and the progression you've made in life? Mm-hmm. I think it influenced me in a lot of ways that are positive, but to tell the truth, there are so many struggles internally that I have had, that I've had a lot of therapy about and have really come so far from, but there are still things that I'm working on that are a result of being treated the way that I was treated. And it'll probably be a lifelong battle to come to, you know, the realization that I'm whole, good, you know, worthy of love, uh, worthy of giving love to others. I mean, I definitely have bonded and mended some of that with my love for my daughter. So, I mean, our lives, all of our lives, the inflection points, both negative and positive shape our lives. And thankfully I went in a more positive direction rather than turning to drugs or alcohol or promiscuity or, you know, those other outlets that some people find themselves at when they're treated unwell. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, you say throughout the book, you know, how, how things have been and how, how you're feeling and things like that. And just seeing the list of people you've worked with and, and what you've achieved and everything. It's very inspirational for people maybe hearing this who are having trouble or anything like that, that you can come out of it at the other end. Absolutely. And I didn't start writing the book to be an inspirational or motivational book or a self-help book. And I'm not yet actually sure it's any of those three things, but hopefully the end effect for people reading it is a bit of inspiration and motivation. And hopefully they also enjoy it as an entertaining read and a good read. I really wanted it to read just beautifully. And if you take something positive away and I impact your life, that's just icing on the cake. Definitely, I think that definitely happens. So you've mentioned your music and you played the violin since childhood. Can you tell us more about your performing and how you created quartets and you have performed for some really cool people? Can you just tell us about your music career in general? Sure. I started playing the violin in fourth grade and I took to it very quickly. I think I was considered somewhat of a prodigy, but I just have to (laughs) admit that this is in Des Moines, Iowa. So if you line me up (laughs) with all you know, children violinists in the world. I probably was not quite a prodigy, but that's okay. I'll take it. And I played in the U Symphony Orchestra at sixth grade with high school students in the back of the violin section, the second violin that was terrifying, but also elating. And I ended up being the concert master of the Iowa State Symphony, getting a full ride scholarship to three different colleges with the violin. And I remember playing at the Iowa State Symphony with Simon Estes, which is this beautiful 
opera singer and, uh, you know, not knowing how many people would be in the audience. And there were a couple of thousands. And as I walked out as the concert master with everyone clapping and the entire orchestra standing, I was just about ready to faint, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but it was, it was wonderful. Well, there's one particular experience you talk about, and I think we've got to highlight it here. You have performed with Clint Eastwood in the front rows. I didn't perform with him. I performed for him. And that was at the Monterey Jazz Festival golf tournament. And I was hired to play for this, I think, after golf dinner concert. And I was told, oh, Clint is going to come in, but don't be put off if he stays just for one song. He's a very busy man. And so I was prepared for that. I was fine with Clint Eastwood hearing me sing. I was excited. But he sat down in the front row and stayed about five feet away from me for the entire set. So that was incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a chunk of the book, in terms of your musical career, it revolves around your friendship with the songwriter Bobby Sharp. How did this impact your career in life? It was amazing. It was such... Like Bobby and I were soulmates in a non-romantic way. That's the best way I can describe it. So it wasn't just musically that he impacted me. It was friendship. It was wisdom. It was history. It was stories about him growing up in Harlem and, you know, just incredible, incredible man. Bobby Sharp wrote the song that is very famous called Unchain My Heart that Ray Charles and Joe Cocker made famous. And it made him eventually a multimillionaire later in life, which is a story in and of itself. He gave me a handful of his songs to record, and I recorded two CDs of his music. And then I took him into the studio and recorded him playing his own music with the band for the first time in 40 years, which was so cool. It was awesome to read. And you have got your music on the web and I will link the heck out of it because <laughs> it, it's it's wonderful. You, you've got some lovely Christmas songs. You've got uh, your more jazzy songs. And I kept finding more and more different performances, which was just so wonderful. Well, I have seven CDs out of my own recordings. Can people still buy the CDs as well? Yes, absolutely. I have a lot of CDs. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I loved how you released the music yourself. Of course, you know, we're talking about you have the time in the internet where you are um, uploading your songs, but you're also (laughs) doing it yourself on your own label. It was it was just so good. It's like, wow, you know, she's done this. It's it's really cool to read. Yeah. Thank you. Would you say I know you, you often said in the book about how you wanted to sing. Would you say you are more of a singer than a violinist, perhaps? Yes. Now, The violin was such a great instrument to take me through sorrows, to be meditative, to get me through college. It was my life. And I didn't really know anything different, but I always wanted to sing and I did sing, but I made the concerted choice to sing when I moved to San Francisco. That's kind of when the flip switched and I was able to reinvent myself. And, you know, I just started singing, writing my own songs on guitar and piano, recorded my first CD called Her Life that I wrote all that music. And then I started singing jazz. Of course, when you read the book, you see that I started singing jazz at a very, very young age with my dad at the piano. And now I just, I think I'm known more as a singer, but on almost every record that I have produced. I'm playing the violin on various songs and the backing tracks. Lovely. It's, it's always nice to, to know when musicians have done multiple things. And you mentioned your dad and your brothers. They are part of your music. They they often join you and do their own music. They mostly do their own. We've tried to do the family band a couple of times and it, <laughs> it doesn't work out as lovely as you would hope. But my brothers both played on Her Life My dad and I have never recorded together, but we do, you know, I'll sing with him as he's playing the piano. Sometimes I'll play the violin with him. They are included in in the videos and and stuff like that. So listeners, they will be linked as well. So I think we will start with the violin for this question and then it's going to morph into something else. Okay. You created the string quartets in the various places you've lived in. You'd move, you'd create another group. 
and this kind of organization and then you found yourself being overbooked this was the beginning of your company entire productions can you tell us about these beginnings more how how it all grew and what entire productions is all about since i was 15 i started playing professionally so what that means is i was paid to play the violin now it was it my full-time job no was it making a serious living no but as I got older and older and more savvy and, you know, I had a marketing engine in my belly, like I really enjoyed branding and marketing. I got more and more gigs, but sometimes I was asked to perform by multiple different people on the same night. And as you can imagine, as a person that was living on their own and fending for themselves, I was not about to turn down any money. So I would tell the clients that I couldn't perform for that I could bring in another group that's as good as I was or better probably and manage them. So I was making two, three, four times as much money on one day by doing that. And so I had unofficially started a business, but it wasn't until 2001 when I gave it a proper name, got a business license and started not only performing myself for these events, but bringing in not just classical string quartets and jazz ensembles. I would then expand to DJs and bands and cigar rollers and aerialists. And now we're a profitable multi-million dollar company providing entertainment and event planning for huge companies like Salesforce and Facebook and Google and Apple and LinkedIn. And I could just name so many, but we're in the San Francisco Bay area. So, you know, those are, those are the companies that live here. You've got videos online of examples of what you do and your own events where you showcase what you can do. And they are something else. I mean, you can imagine someone stepping <laughs> in there and going, oh my goodness, this is incredible. Yeah. Um, but of course, then you've had the pandemic, um, <laughs> which is going to have affected you guys quite a lot. What happened? It affected us to the point where multi-million dollar in revenue went to zero in March of 2020. And I had to lay off half of my team. It felt horrible. It was humiliating. Honestly, I was savvy enough to do it before other companies that were like mine. And so it felt very alienating and, you know, kind of like, am I a horrible person? But quickly after everyone in my industry, 80% of the event industry was laid off or fired. We moved to doing virtual events and we were so successful in completing 200 virtual events at the end of 2020. We did another 200 or so in 2021, Uh, but in 2021, some live events started coming back like social events, weddings, anniversaries, birthday parties. And now that the Omicron variant has passed by, people are really starting to amp up and start planning in-person events. The really big over-the-top events aren't happening quite yet, but we're hoping and praying that third and fourth quarter will just be incredible. Well, you've talked about weddings and stuff just there, and that was something I saw when you see, I suppose, from looking at your website, the kind of events that you do, the bigger ones. What kind of things do you do for a wedding? For weddings, we book string quartets, jazz ensembles, solo singers, dance bands, And sometimes we do like really fun flash mobs or we'll do like a samba dance group that just comes through during the dance set and then disappears after doing like a 20 minute set. And then we're in the San Francisco Bay area. So people like to do weird, quirky things that are fun. So I think someone hired us once to have a stilt walker walk their dog down the aisle. (laughs) (laughs) We've said about musician, violinist and singer. Would you say you're more of a musician than a businesswoman or are they equal? Hmm. That is, that's the first time anyone has asked me that. In my heart and soul and core, as well as length of time, I'm a musician and artist and creative. But I, I do think my brain is split equally between analytical business and creative, which I think is somewhat unusual. And I love them both, but I've only been really in serious business for 20 years. I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but I think it painted a good picture. 
No, I think it does. Do you ever feel imposter syndrome? All the time, but I have to push it away. And, you know, at first, you know, I, I think I've always been pushing through it before it was sort of raw and sort of like get out of my way imposter syndrome. But now when I have it, I'm more thoughtful about it. And I'm like, okay, why am I feeling this way? What can I do to get past it? What is really at the core of it? Because I know I can do anything I set my mind to. So why, why are these feelings coming into play? And once I figure that out, Sometimes it takes just a thought. Sometimes it takes some pondering. I'm able to just get over it. And imposter syndrome typically means that you don't have the skills or the access or the ability or the capacity to do the thing that you're doing or the experience. So then I just fill in the blanks, do the work, learn it, start without trying to be perfect so that you can have some repetition under your belt. So then you become at least fluent, if not an expert at the thing. Fake it until you make it kind of thing as such. Fake it until you figure it out. I like that. No, I like that a lot. (laughs) You said about why you wrote Relentless. I have to ask, why now? Why in this particular part of your life? Well, I started it four years ago. So why then? (laughs) And then why did it take so long? Or why did I finally decide to publish now? So many questions. I am at a point in my life where I can say these incredibly vulnerable things in the book. And I do not shy away. Like there's some things in the book that I'm sure people read it and say, oh my God, I can't believe she's admitting that or, or saying that out loud. And I know that I can be of service to help other people by being vulnerable and showing them that I came from an an impossible situation and punched through and got to where I wanted to go. Or let's rephrase it. I'm going to where I want to go because it's not over yet. Mm -hmm. I read the book and yeah, I, I thought it takes a lot of a lot of courage if I if I can say so, you know, to to, to write what you had and, and kind of put it down on paper. Well, it did. <laughs> and sometimes I think, why did you do that? <laughs> but with everyone's response, I'm so glad that I did because I'm helping people and also helping people understand me. And then also probably helping people understand other people. Yeah, you you are providing the information for anyone in any sort of similar space in their own life and giving them almost like giving them a voice giving them the help and stuff like that yeah yeah Yeah. so I mean on this note I believe the proceeds from the sales are going to Covenant House a portion of the proceeds and um, also from my speaking will be going to the Covenant House which is this incredible nonprofit organization that helps people that are unhoused or homeless get back on their feet. Were they part of a system that helped you or have you come to hear of them later? I found them later. However, they're similar to the shelter that I stayed in when I was in Des Moines, Iowa. I was able to speak for them in LA, in Los Angeles a few years ago, and they have sites across the United States and I think some in Canada. So I chose them because I really believe in what they're doing and really like how they're, how they're doing it. It seems quite a, a big thing and definitely worth checking out, listeners. So you are a podcaster yourself, which was, it's always exciting to hear that as a podcaster. Can you tell us about Fascinating Entrepreneurs? Yes, I started it in January of last year, 2021, and I interview entrepreneurs that I find fascinating or their business is fascinating. Hopefully they're both. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And they typically are a million dollars in revenue or more. And they have a team of full-time employees because we talk about culture, core values, building a team and such. And I love it. I learn so much. I meet incredible people. And I just found out from someone else I didn't even know this, that we're in the top 1.5% of all podcasts in the world, of which there are 3 million. And I was like, what? (laughs) So that was exciting. So people are listening. They're listening and they're sticking around and listening to it. 
I don't know if they're listening all the way through, but yeah, you've got a very good format. It's it's definitely worth a listen, and it's it's very well done. Thank you. What's next in terms of writing? Are you writing another book? I am. So I am writing a business book, and I have actually written a how to write your own story memoir. It's a course, but I've written a, a workbook that goes with it, which I am so excited about because I'm I'm showing people how to do it. All the ways I wrote that were good and all the ways that I wrote that I wish I had done. Mm. <laughs> and Jamie Blaine is going to be helping me teach this course. Also, I'd love to do, I have 20, I think I have 24 hours of recording interviews of Bobby Sharp and his life growing up in Harlem. And it's incredible. So I'd love to write his story. And, you know, maybe I'll be keeping journals and notes about my life from the, you know, where the book ends, where Relentless ends and and write a follow-up to that. I also thought about writing a book about how I parented Bennett because I did it in a more unusual way than, um, you know, people around me. And I think talking about that might be helpful to people. I don't know. Now I've opened the floodgates to writing books and I started my own imprint. So I'll be publishing my books on the poignant press imprint, as well as that of others, entrepreneurs and people that come through my course. Fantastic. And I'm going to guess what listeners are thinking here. You say about how you've parented Bennett. Can you give us yes. a, a, an example? I can. There's some in the book and you'll probably agree that there are not many mothers out there that are so open with their daughters, right? So I knew from an early age that Bennett should be treated as a whole person, not necessarily an adult, but one that has the similar heart and soul as they would be when they're adult. So I explained to her about, you know, lust and romance and crushes and described her body parts in a very specific way where, you know, we didn't make up words and talk to her about sex and talk to her about when she would encounter drinking and drugs, the introduction to that. So instead of making it taboo or something she'd be punished for, I really demanded that she was honest with me. And if she were honest with me, then there would be no punishment. For instance, if she tried alcohol, of course, I didn't encourage it. And I didn't encourage any of it, the sex, the alcohol or anything like that. But I knew at certain cadences of life, she was going to be introduced to that. And no other parents were doing what I was doing. So some of them would say, Natasha, can you ask Bennett not to um, tell our daughters about sex quite yet? (laughs) And so I would say to Bennett, Bennett, you've got to keep this to yourself and to their parents, describe it to them. Of course, that did not work out. (laughs) You know, though, she is so appreciative of how she was brought up. I think she feels very confident. And I wonder, you know, how she'll parent her own children. You know, we'll see. There's no way to know. She doesn't have children yet. (laughs) Well, something I was wondering about asking, and this might be all right to ask it here. Were you uh, worried about parenting? Oh, yes. I was terrified that I would be angry and horrible and abusive to any child that I had. And that's a healthy way to, you know, approach it. Mm. (laughs) Right. And so I, I sought therapy when I was pregnant with Bennett and I was very young. I was 24. And, um, I don't know if the therapist knew this for sure, or if she knew that telling me what she told me was going to help me so much. In any case, it helped. She looked at me after the third session and said, Natasha, you're not going to abuse your child. Don't even worry about it again. And that gave me the confidence that I could have this child and treat her well. And I did just that. You knew what not to do as such. I did. And and I asked, I read books, right? I read all the parenting books, what to expect when you're expecting and Dr. Spock. And I took in, you know, I'm a very coachable person. So when someone would say to me, always sleep when your baby sleeps, I'm like, okay, I'll do that. Or if your baby's screaming their head off, you've already fed them and changed them and there shouldn't be anything wrong with them. And you are at the point of your breaking point, put them in their crib, 
and walk to the other side of the house. So those were great pointers, right? And I did just that. She was safe, but I didn't have to be listening to her screaming. You know, that just elevates the frustration. Mm-hmm. Slightly different topic, but still your daughter, something that's been lovely to find out, kind of along with, you know, seeing your family as well. Is she sings as well. She does. In fact, we're doing a book launch performance in San Francisco where I'll be playing with my band and singing as well as reading excerpts from the book. And Bennett is going to come on stage and sing the song I wrote about her called Over the Moon from my CD, Her Life. And we're really excited about it. She's at the MoMA right now, just looking at art with a friend. But when she gets back, I'm babysitting her dog. We're going (laughs) to rehearse it. So yeah, I mean, she's not a professional singer. If she ever decided to do music as a profession, she would far exceed my success. But I don't know if she's that interested in it in that way. I mean, yeah, you, your book launch sounds absolutely wonderful. Just such a, a different kind of atmosphere. And yeah, it's it's lovely that you were joining together with your, with your daughter in that. And yeah. um, fantastic. Yes, I'm so looking forward to that. Yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> so... Natasha, is there anything else that you would like to say at the end of this podcast? Anything else that we haven't covered enough or that we haven't covered at Mm. all that you would like to say? I think in parting, I would just say that, you know, if you're listening to this and you have doubts about whether you can do something, whether you have access to it, whether you have the talent for it, whether it's for someone like you, that you definitely do. You just have to do the work, figure it out have the right mindset and go for it. And no one's going to save you, but you absolutely can save yourself. Definitely. Natasha, this has been absolutely lovely having you. It's It was lovely to read your book. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Charlie. It was amazing. Links to purchase Relentless are in the episode description. If you have enjoyed today's discussion, do subscribe or follow the podcast on your listening app of choice. The Wormhole Podcast, episode 58, was recorded on the 15th of March and published on the 11th of April, 2022. Music and production by Charlie Place.